Hey, good evening, everyone. My name is Mark Hummel, and welcome to Mark Hummel's Harmonica Party. We're sponsored by Seidel Harmonicas, Electrify Records, and Mountaintop Records. And uh, we're doing part two of an interview with uh, my friend Steve Freund, who's lived, uh, lived for 20 years in Chicago in the heart of the Chicago blues scene and worked with everyone from <clears throat> Snooky Pryor to James Cotton, Otis Rush, Coco Taylor, Lonnie Brooks, Sonny Land Slim for 20 years, Pine Top Perkins, Big Walter Horton, Magic Slim, <clears throat> Floyd Jones, Lewis Myers and the Aces, Carrie Bell, Hubert Sumlin, Lee Jackson, Homesick James, Luther Allison, and on and on and on. And I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, a couple Chicago guys we didn't talk about in the last episode. But then we're going to move on to the comparison between Chicago blues and California blues. Because I know you moved out here in 1994 right. when you were, I think the first time you came out was 92 with James Cotton. When you, no, when you actually, the first time I came out here was 78 okay. with Sunnyland. With Sunnyland. Yeah, we played with Eddie Vinson. Queen but, Vinson. but you mentioned something about that when you came out here with Cotton in 92, that's when you decided you might no, want to move out. No, it was out. 94, actually. It oh, it was, was 94, it was okay. summer of 94. We played L.A. and down there, and we drove back up here, and I was already sick of Chicago at that point. Right, right. And I was driving, and I remember on... I was coming through Berkeley or whatever, and it's so beautiful, the hills and the mountains. Right. And I'm saying, what the hell am I doing in Chicago? <laughs> and I said, I, you know. Anyway, I, I ended up starting out by Santa Barbara for three months, and I went to Oakland. Right. And I'm part of this. Been here right. Ever since. And I think that was when me and you reconnected. Yeah, is when, yeah, definitely. When you came up to Oakland. So, so essentially, what I was going to say is uh, uh, all mm -hmm. these Chicago players that you got to work with, um, I mean, I know there's certain people that are, that are that are real kind of mysterious. One of them is a guy named Lee Jackson <clears throat> that was a great guitar player that played with Willie Dixon for quite some time. Yeah. Uh, you know, guys like the Aces, you know, Lewis Myers and Dave Myers and Fred Bilo. Uh, you know, because these guys were essentially Chicago acts, I mean, people like the Aces toured a little bit. <clears throat> Lee toured with Dixon, but really, you know, you don't you don't hear of these. There were so many g gigs available local yeah. that, like Sunnyland said, well, why do I have to go out on the road? I make right. the same money. I sleep in my he own bed. Sleep in his own bed. So he yeah. didn't care about like notoriety and fame because I guess he felt he was already famous enough. Right. And therefore, he just wanted to get the, you know, go home at night. Because mm -hmm. the road, as you know, man, the road is really hard. The and, road you know, is ridiculous. brutal. Yeah. And, it, and it's just gotten more and more brutal as time has gone on yeah. because it used to be you could play a week in each place or two weeks in each place. Now, you know, over the last 20 years, 30 years, it's been only, you know, one, one nighters. And that's all that's available most of the time. Yeah, it's pretty rough. So on somebody that's in their, you know, 70s or 80s, that's a pretty hard lifestyle. Yeah, that's hard. I'm in my 60s, and it's hard on me. I know. And I've been doing it for 36 uh, years. And, and you put millions you know. of miles on. So. Yeah. And yeah. and so so I, I guess I can I could totally understand why these guys would feel this way. Um the the other thing is, I mean, you know, what would you say about? I mean, you know, I was going to get into this a little bit because I know back when I first started getting into blues, and I'm sure it's the same with you, that yeah. alcohol was such a major kind of part of it still is the blues the blues world. Well, it is. I mean, you know, you know especially I, back then, I, I still drink. I still have a couple of drinks a day. But, right. You know, I'm, right. I think I'm in control. Yeah. You know. I, yeah, you know, if it ever came to the point where I was out of control, I, I'd have to stop. But um, some of those guys were. Some guys get violent when they get drunk. Right. You know, you see a lot of a lot of shootings and stuff. There's a lot of violence mm -hmm. in the clubs. Um, but it's part, you know, it's just a social scene. You know. Did so you carry a gun back then? Um, I, I'm taking the fifth on that. Because <laughs> I know it many. Was, I know most bad. people. It was bad did. at one point. There was bad. There was a there was a neo Nazi going around. I, I, you know, I came out of my apartment one day and I went, I saw blood on my car I'm in the front. And I went down to the White Hand to get a cup of coffee and there were three cops in there and I said, you know, I just got up, I lived two blocks down on Clark Street there and there's blood on my car and he looks at me and he says, where were you parked? And I told him, he said, oh, well last night there was a cab driver who took a guy down the alley and the guy turned out to be a neo-Nazi and he 
killed the cab, he shot the cab driver, and the driver of the cab got out of his car and stumbled and stumbled onto your car, and then he died. And at that point, I, wow. had, to, I had to do something. So, yeah. Yeah. And then, you know, that was towards the end of my stay, and I was starting to say, what am I doing here? So you came out to you came out to California, and you said you were able to get work immediately once you came out here. <clears throat> I did. I was lucky enough. I knew Walter Shufflesworth, and he was the band leader of the Dynatones, the soul band. And uh, we we met each other down at a, a gig. I think it was at the uh, Eli Eli Mile High Club. Not this one, but the other location is near Funeral Parlor. You remember that? That was that? Yoshi's. Yoshi's. Yeah. No, that was okay. my funeral parlor. So right, I, that, right, I got right. there and everybody was there. All my old friends were there. Like, you know, the guys from Chicago was there. Like right. Nick was there. And, um, Walter was Swing. there. Yeah, right. yeah, everybody yeah. was like, it's all Chicago guys. And Walter said, I need a guitar player. I, my guy is, wants to leave. And I said, I got a lot of work. Oh, I got a lot of, a, lot of, a lot of traveling. He said, I said okay. I had a hustle. I had to find a place to live. I didn't even have a place. I ended up living in a house with like four other people. You know, just like as a roommate. Thing. I think I vaguely remember. It was that. horrible. Yeah. You came yeah. over one time. It was horrible. I think horrible. I do. I vaguely remember. It was remember really horrible. Yeah. Then I moved to Richmond, yeah. and then finally I bought a house in Vallejo. So right. I've been here. So the other thing, I mean, I should mention. I mean, I don't know if this is getting too personal, but I know back when you know that was that was around the time that I was uh, newly married and had a had a daughter, and you'd been freshly divorced, and I think. Yeah. You kind of were, through, you were around, you I, were go, you were I was around going through the divorce. Right. And we were both, and, and not long after you went through yours, I went through mine. And, and just, there was a lot of similarities That's in terms still, of our personal lives. Still, my favorite song last time in Florida. Right. <laughs> One that I still so, doing yeah. pretty quick. So we, we were, we went through the same thing at almost the same time. Almost identical. Yeah. Not, not pleasant. Yeah. Not a, not a good yeah. time. Because it was both of our kids basically ended up in different states. Yeah. This is the way it is. Yeah. So, you know, so I, I just think that uh, I think that there's so many things that contribute to what blues is. <clears throat> yeah. You know, it's life experience. I mean, you know, it is. It's life experience. And, you know, we talk about the old timers and, and what they went through, you know, in terms of just racism in the South Sorry. And, and, and moving up to Chicago. And, and, and for, you know, us younger white guys, I think it ends up being a thing of, you know, life experience and, you know, a crappy job or a bad marriage or, you know, drinking too much or whatever, you know, whatever the, the, the things end up being that are kind of your, oh, I don't know, how would you put it? Your well, trial by fire in the blues. Well, I basically. don't, you know, I don't, I, I, a lot of times white, white musicians get accused of, of co-opting or stealing a, a musical form from the African-Americans. And I guess some, some, in some ways, they do. I personally feel that I love the blues. I yeah. just love it. Yeah. And I try to I, I em, have empathy with oppressed, uh, you know, oppressed right. peoples because I come from, I'm Jewish. I'm just going to proud to be Jewish. But we come from an oppression, a history of oppression. Mm -hmm. And so we don't, we're not black. You know, I mean, I walk out on the street, I'm not black. Nobody hates me right off the bat. If you're black, I guess there are some really bad people who just hate you. Right off the bat, they don't even know you. Right. That's true racism. Yeah. And um, so I, I, I can't really experience that because you know I could tell I'm, I'm white. But there's a there was a there's long a, there was a, a long history of, of of Jewish people being in mm -hmm. business with like for example I mean you know a lot of the record owners that recorded <clears throat> blues records were Jewish. And they and they hired you know. Muddy to paint the paint the apartment paint the, But here's the thing. The, the Jewish black um, relationship throughout the 20th century was a, a, a very dynamic. The, di the dynamic was many times nobody else would hire a black person except right. a Jewish person. Right. Because we know how it is. And, you know, to, to really, one thing that really got me, I just fit, found this out not too long ago, is a Jewish family in New Orleans called the Karnowskis family who bought Louis Armstrong his first trumpet and basically fostered him as a small child. Wow. Yeah. You know, the other thing is there's a long history in the South of Jewish families, you know, that came up there and kind of found some financial success in the South. <clears throat> so, and a lot of people don't even, aren't even aware of there's that. There's Jews down there. We're That's every, what we're I'm every, saying. We're everywhere. That's what I'm saying. We're everywhere. Yeah. You know. But, so. You know, and, and, and the older black guys, you know, they, like Sunnyland, he knew. 
that we had, a, you know, they, he hired me. Look at Muddy. He hired the Jewish guys. Right. right? Sure did. Jerry yeah, and Bob. Or, Jerry and Bob. And know? Paul. And, yeah. Yeah. And Paul. Right. Yeah. And yeah. so, you know, that's just a thing. I'm, I'm not saying all Jewish guys are great blues artists by any means. Right. And, um, uh, but you know, there does seem to be a correlation a lot of Some times. of my favorite musicians are Gentiles. Right. Regular, you know, just Catholic or, uh, you know, Protestant guys. Right. Even Muslims play the blues great. There's some right. guys too. Right. Everybody can. It's, yeah. it's you got to be able to just bring out your life experience through the instrument or your vocals. But the black folks are the greatest singers to me. Yeah. Because they, and that was one thing Muddy said yeah, initially. Yeah. He said when the one one white guys can sing the blues. Nobody can sing like you know, He goes, nobody can sing But there is one guy I'm going to tell you. Well, Boss Gaggs is a hell of a great singer. He's a hell of a great singer. And there was a guy here that, yep. I, that I played with. Paul Butterfield was a hell of a singer. Yep. And the guy that really influenced me a lot to really try to sing is Roger Troy, Jelly Roll. Right. Who played bass with Nick and Nick, him. Yeah. And Butterfield for a minute. Yeah. yeah. And he was in, uh, you know, played an electric flag, I guess, sure too. Sure did. Yeah. But he lived out in California. I got to play with him. And he was, Sonny Lynn said, he's the greatest white singer I've ever Wow. Heard. Ever. That's heavy. Ever. He said yeah. it to me, personally. So how was Butterfield to work with when you worked with him? He's brilliant. Brilliant guy, but very incorrigible. You know, you know, he's always going to get in trouble. Was he under control? <laughs> you guys he was musically. He was. But, I mean, you know, was he? He was. He had just. He didn't get into too much trouble. He had just undergone surgery. Oh, okay. So, so yeah, that's a, when I met he him. He had a yeah. little perforated uh, right stomach thing going right. on. And all bleeding uh, ulcer. Yeah, so yeah. He had to really watch it. Yeah. And he did. That's when I met him. Yeah. I think. I, I I I have nothing bad to say about him at all. Yeah. I thought he was a yeah. brilliant artist. Yeah. And he carried his fame pretty well. Yeah. Now here's here's some other guys. I mean, I, I've I've always heard BB King as being a huge influence in your playing, but also guys like Otis Rush, who I saw you play with a couple <clears throat> times. That was just it's hard to play like uh, like to try to <clears throat> even attempt that kind of thing because they're left handed. Yeah, and they yeah. They, they play it upside down, but they right. pull the strings. They pull the strings. Albert King yeah. and Otis. Right. Now, you know, Otis was an Albert King freak. You know? I know he was. Yeah. Yeah. And those guys did that record together. Right. Door to door. On chess? Oh yeah, which is half which is album, not half. yeah, it's half and half, but it wasn't them playing together. No, right. but they did the record. Thing. I right. think they were like brothers after that. Right. Like Otis looked up to Albert. He sure did. And it just great. Albert yeah. King was the greatest. I actually I had an epiphany when I was about nineteen years old at the Fillmore. When Albert, I was live, I was there for that you know that recording. It's Albert King live at the Fillmore. Yeah, yeah, I was there. In fact, the vid, they, I'm in the video. You could see me in the video. Oh, okay. I'm thinking of something else. I'm thinking of Livewire Blues. I think that's the one. I thought that was a Fillmore West. No. Well, the one they did at Fillmore East, I'm there. Oh, okay. I was there. And um, he said, he actually, I was at the early show, and then he said, now, you know, we're all recording today, tonight, so I want you all to come back for the second show because it wasn't sold out. He said, all y'all from the first show, we got to clear out the house, but I want you all to come back. And if anybody says something, you just say, Albert King said, you can come in. Wow. So we all, I went back and I was there the whole night. And I had an epiphany uh, when Albert was playing. And, you know, he was, it's a call and answer, you know, singing and then you call him, uh, answering, right? Right. He could talk. And when I closed my eyes and I, the way his guitar came out, it sounded like a, a woman's voice hmm. answering him back. Wow. And then, and then I, these thoughts came to me is that it was his, he was channeling his mother for some reason. Hmm. His mother was getting chastised. And what did you take that him. night? I, I took a bunch <laughs> of stuff. That was part of the deal, you know. This don't forget now. Uh, this was back in the sixties. This is in the sixties. Or, or the late, yeah. early seventy, right. very early seventy. But uh, that's I had the epiphany right then. I swear to God, and I said I'm going to be I'm going to be a professional blues guitar player because of Albert King. Right. And I really felt that, and I did it. Yeah. And that's it. Yeah. Well, um, I, I, I want to get into some, some stuff in the, in the 2000s because uh, I used you on a, a, a couple. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, the first, thing, the first thing that we did together was the Heart of Chicago record. Yeah, I remember and that. And that was in the 90s. So that was 96, I think. Yeah. 96. And I remember the reason I asked you to produce it was because I wanted to go to Chicago and make a record with a bunch of these guys. And this was before I really knew anybody, but you and Dave Myers were the only guys I knew. Well, you knew Billy. I knew Billy, yes. But I didn't I, know Billy, but, and I'd met but I was able, Bill But I was able to put together the rhythm section. But you put yeah. together, like, Bob Stroger and Willie Smith, who I yeah. got to be friends with 
later on. And I got you a room at the Heart of Chicago Motel. No, I was already staying there. I mean, I think did, by that didn't time. I tell you about that place? No, that was, no, that no. Was my place. No, I was staying there way before that. Okay. Because I was staying there in the in the in the early nineties. That was a little secret. That was musicians yeah. knew. No, no, I was staying there in the early nineties. Okay. But we named the album after that motel. Yeah. I don't think they ever put up a CD in the lobby though. <laughs> that, that kind of pissed me off. Yeah. But uh, uh, anyway, that was a dream come true for me to be able to record that CD in Chicago because. It was a chance to work with a bunch of these guys that I'd been, you know, listening to forever. I mean, having Dave on it was a was a real thrill for me, because I'd known Dave since you know the early '90s, and uh, I remember I didn't even know if he was going to show up because you know he was being a little kind of evasive about it. Yeah. And then he ended up being the very first guy when we got there. Yeah. That was waiting for us. Yeah. So. Um, <clears throat> That was one of the last things I think he recorded. He didn't record much after that, as I recall. I think he did something with, um, with Rusty. Didn't that was prior to that. Oh, really? Uh, yeah. yeah, that was prior yeah, to that. Yeah, Dave. Uh, yeah. He looked so strong and robust to me always. He was a yeah. nice, stocky guy. Yeah, he was. And then he's gone. Well, this, yeah, yeah, you never know. Diabetes. Yeah, it's, you know. it's a killer. Yeah. And so anyway, that, was, that album, I remember, got a lot of a lot of attention to the point where a lot of people thought I was from Chicago after that. Oh, great. Yeah. yeah. So it was kind of funny. You know, I'd be on the road and people would go, like, from Chicago, Mark Hummel. And it's, it's like, no. Well, your music is certainly pure Chicago. Well, and I think that's what it was. So that's kind of one of the things I wanted to get into <clears throat> is, is the difference that you hear between Chicago blues and, and West Coast blues. Well, for, to start with, we have some amazing Chicago blues style musicians here. Right. The one thing I noticed is more of a, when I moved here, was more of a fusion stuff, and I would say it descends down from Robin Ford, because he's super, super popular. So mm -hmm. you've got guys who adapted that style, which is more of an overdriven type tone. Right. Not the clean, you know, like Fender Super Reverb tone. Right. There's definitely more of the overdrive. So that's popular. Um, and uh, we have some world-class virtuosic musicians here. You know, there's so many great musicians. Yeah. Um, not that many great vocalists as much as in Chicago, but there are some. Mm -hmm. There are definitely some. But. Yeah. And then I noticed that, of course, you had guys like, you know, um, Charlie Musselwhite and Elvin Bishop, who are basically Chicago blues artists. Right. Anyway, and they're here already. They're, they've been here for 40, 50 years. Right. Yeah. And originally you had Luther Tucker and Francis Clay, well, John well, Lee Hooker. Well, the Butterfield Band really started that migration. Right. I think. Yeah. They did. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yeah. so. absolutely. Nick Gravenitis. Oh, yeah. Nick. Yeah. Yeah. So you had a lot of guys moving out from Chicago from '68 on. Yeah, that that's really, really what really it was. Really early, when we yeah. were, you know, when you were a kid, a, right. When I was a teenager, right. I mean, um, like you know, Paul Butterfield. I think they moved out. You know, like like you say, I was only like 15 or 16 years old. And those guys were already mm -hmm. major artists, living in the hate, whatever they're doing, and right part of the summer of love and the whole thing. And, right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, Muscle. I, I had great stories about when he first was walking along the hate and had his hair all greased and wearing the sunglasses and, and yeah. people going, wow, far out, man, where are you from? Yeah. <laughs> but I was also- well, Where are you from? I also got, was really into canned heat. Right. The original canned heat. Right. I thought they were fantastic. Yeah. I think Alan Wilson was- They're the from LA. Guy. Well, Alan was from Boston. Right, but the I other guys were- Yeah. But they're great. They were great. They they played the real blues. They almost was almost like a jug band yeah. approach. Yeah. Yeah. But it was a perfect blend of tradition and with um, Vestine Psych and psychedelic with Vestine on the guitar. Sound. Yeah. Right. It was a. It was like yeah. old days. It's like it was right. shapes of things to come. You know. This yeah. Is, In a lot of ways, I think those guys probably did the best uh, John Lee Hooker album of. Well, I, you know I, the '70s. See how they were able to jump his time. Yeah, and you know he said uh, Alan Wilson's the greatest. They really the played great yeah. with him. Just yeah. fabulous. They really did. So, um, so what? What would you? So you would say like the overdriven sound on the guitar? That's a big difference. But yeah. then there's also a lot of. I think there's sounds. more swing in the in the oh, West Coast. Oh, that whole Coast. phenomenon. Yeah. yeah, that was. Yeah. That's not so prevalent as much anymore now. Have you notice? Yeah, Those but it was it was when, when we're I got talking, here. When you got here, it was. I actually yeah. played a few gigs with Indigo Swing when right. I got here. Right, exactly. Yeah. But I'm a blues guy in my life. and the Skillet Liquors. Yeah, those are, they're great. Yeah, yeah they're yeah. great. There were a number of bands back then. Yeah, yeah. they were great. But um, 
And Swing is is a part of your. Well, I, I actually saw Benny Goodman and um, uh, Woody Herman back in right. New York. You know, I remember seeing you play a gig in Chicago one time, and you were playing a bunch of Charlie Christian. Type. I'm trying to, but yeah. I can't really play. Like yeah, that. I went to see Stefan Grappelli twice. Right. Wow, you know, and yeah. met him and talked to him, and yeah. uh, I'm heavy, heavy into that stuff, you know. But when I play, it's it keeps just keeps coming out like this basic. Mississippi, you know, basic. That's that's the style of BB and Albert is basically a Mississippi style. Yeah, you know, the simple stuff. Well, you have a you very, know. to me, you have a very uh, Chicago style in the sense of that you really did kind of marry mm -hmm. the the country blues with the electric blues. Kind of like Big and, Bill, like a transition, very much like what a those guys did. Thing. Yeah, yeah, very much what those guys. Did. I mean, and then these all unknown guys like Lee Cooper. For years, I thought it was Big Big Bill on guitar, and you guys told me that's right. Lee Cooper. Right, that was and Rusty I, the guy. And I refused that. to yeah. believe yeah. it. I said, "No, right. it's Bill." It's yeah, Bill. Because I, 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 <laughs> I thought so too. It was I, Rusty was the one that that yeah. tipped me off to that. Yeah, that was pretty yeah. amazing stuff. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's funny that a lot of the the guys on the Bluebird records were were guys that were really jazz musicians. You had guys like Willie Lacey or Ransom Noling or uh, 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 even Blind John was kind of a Blind judge. John played everything. Yeah, he played he, everything. He, as, he could, you could have hired him at as a circus. The, he could have played at a Ringling Brother. Brothers circus. <laughs> so, um, yeah, the, the, you had this really heavy jazz influence in the 30s and 40s I know. Yeah. blues records. Now, somebody like Kester, he, he just passed away, and Kester's a guy that uh, started Delmark Records in the 50s, right. and then by the 60s started recording more and more blues, yeah. and not just jazz, because he right. started as a jazz yeah. guy. And uh, he's, you know, he's the guy that made people like Magic Sam and, and Junior Wells a lot more famous because that Junior Wells record, the Hoodoo Man, that's yeah, that the continued number, the number one record selling yeah. album. Exactly. Well, yeah, and people who work there, like I work there, in right. the basement packing records during the Christmas right. rush. But guys like Bruce Iglauer and right that uh, started Jerry, with yeah, even started Blind with Pig uh, Jerry I think worked yeah. with everybody and even guys like Big Joe and Muscle White were living in his basement at the time. Big Joe's and, guitar was in that place for years, right. and I used to I played it. Yeah, it Charlie crazy. used to work in the storeroom and all yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I mean, he was such an influence on the Chicago scene in, in the '60s, and continued to be. And I know you did. Your first record, your first three records, as I recall, were no, or no, no, no. I shouldn't say your first three. You're like fourth, fifth, and sixth. I was like on that. a record label at first. I forget the name. Pete Crawford and Irwin Helfer owned this record right. label. So I know you that. had a couple smaller. Labels and then I was on for. one with Gloria Hardiman, which was bought and put out by Delmark a few years back. Right. Those are the small ones. Then uh, my friend Dave Spector. Uh, he got established there and then right. he produced a couple of records on me. Right. And so you had C's for Chicago and, and I'll be your mule. I'll be your mule. And then, and I then did you a, did one with Spectre. I did a I double album. Yeah. And I'm on a bunch of records on other guys. Right. Like I that. think I played on the one with Spectre actually. So. You are. You're yeah. on. Uh, yeah. I got my brand on you. Right. That's right. The Muddy Team. Yeah. So so uh, um, what what was it like recording with Boz? Because I love that album. <clears throat> Boz is a consummate professional. A great guy. He's a perf almost a perfectionist, mm -hmm. and he knows how to get it. He yeah. knows exactly what he wants, and he knows the procedure of um, how to record the certain instruments at one time. What's These the What's the name of that album now? The Boss come, come, come on home. Come on home, which is just a fabulous. It really is. Record. It's it's, it's, it's one I can record. listen to over and over. I know he wrote yeah. some great songs on there yeah. too. My favorite on that is I've Got Your Love. It's, a, it's like a ballad. Oh, that's a great one. Isn't that that's amazing? A killer. Yeah. Killer album. It yeah. almost sounds like Southern rock, but it's so, it's, he plays a great guitar solo he on does. it. He does. And he sings great on it. He loves the yeah. British guys, too. Yeah. Right? He's yeah. a good Clapton and Peter Green. Interesting. He yeah. loves those guys. Yeah. Yeah. And there's also uh, uh, Love Letters is, is one of my favorites on that. Oh, boy. What a good, yeah. good record. Yeah. And we recorded that up at Skywalker Studios. You know, that was owned by. Um, oh, Lucas. 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 Yeah. We did that wow. up there, and it's on up there yeah. in Marin. And a lot of people don't know. I mean, Boz owned uh, Boz Skaggs owned Swims. It closed down, and I think Great American for a while too. Yeah. Partners, partners, yeah. yeah, right. So, um, in two thousand one, I hired you for a blowout tour. I remember, and it was the first tour that I had James Cotton on, and I had Charlie Musselwhite on it. And I remember we did, uh, we did. 
at least a week and a half, two weeks, I think, on the road with that. Wait, as I recall. That, that was 2001? That was 2001 that we was did the Billy one. Was Billy on that one? No, no, this was strictly just, uh, this was just with Charlie. Uh, uh, did I play? Yeah, you played. You backed Charlie Musselwhite and, and, and James Cotton. Wow. Um, I was on it. Uh, Gary Smith might have been on a couple and Andy Santana. Uh, was that a California tour? It was a California tour, but we may have gone and done some Northwest stuff. Wow. I can't remember. Boy, it's hard to remember all yeah, these things. Yeah, it is hard to remember. But that was the first time I'd ever worked with James. And then the thing I remember so well is you guys backing up. About two years later, you backed up James on a gig at, a, I think, SF State or something. You and your band. Oh, yeah. And I, I remember... Have, oh, oh, oh um, Overton on drums? No, it was uh, Kevin Coggins. I think it was Coggins and, and Tim Wagar. Tim Wagar, yeah. Oh yeah. And oh, I remember that. I remember that gig really well because it was the first time I really saw James worked with a band. He he knew that you knew your stuff, but he didn't know about the rhythm section. And I remember watching him and how well he directed the band, and I it just knocked me out because he was such a good band. You leader. know, he was one of my heroes. I remember being in, remember I was telling you about the Brooklyn Blues Busters in Brooklyn? I just remember this one night, it was probably 1970, and it was a cold winter's night, and I had a day, a night job, and I was in there, and all of a sudden, James Cotton is in there. Right. And he's wearing that one of those long overcoats like you, right. see, like you see on the records. Right. And it was just like, to me, it was like, oh my God. It's like seeing a guy. And then or the something. next time yeah, I'm right. there, I'm sitting next to him, yeah. and I'm singing, yeah. you know, and he's playing. Yeah. And it's just how life can take you on these journeys. I know. Man. Yeah, that's kind of that's kind of what it's been like for me in a lot of it's a lot of these areas. Because I mean, Cotton was the very one of the very first guys. He's so heavy, man. Today's he, his birthday. Today He's is his man. birthday. We're recording this on his birthday. It won't air on his birthday, but it is today. Is was he born in 1932? 1935. July first, 1935, and uh, Cotton died in 2017. I think in February. And uh, he was just one of these guys that was really larger than life. That's the best way for to put it. In my eyes, it was just like he uh, he, he was hard. Was, he was hard to kill. He, he was, was extremely hard to kill. Hard to kill. <laughs> he had bullet holes all through his chest uh, from al almost being murdered by a guy in Chicago in the in the early '60s or mid '60s. And uh, you know, he went through a lot of. Battles with alcohol and drugs, and so, but you know, you know every night he paid really well, and every night he would personally pay me. Yeah, and he'd come into my knock on my door, right? And he said he'd hand me the money and say, "Thank you, thank you very much." You know, I want to say the last twenty years of his life or something, uh, he got himself together. The, the The bottom line is, Cotton was all a very lucky kind of almost zealot type character. That's that's how I would. Yeah, you know what? Him. He was kind of blessed. He had yes. a star over him. He was. Because he, he, out of nowhere, he got yeah. this big career. Yeah, he had an know? incredible career. And that was that was in the, uh, you know, that was because... Starting when he was like 10 years old or well, something. His well, it really happened when he hanging out with Butterfield and them. And, no, and no, way before Albert that. Albert Grossman was, made him popular. He was hanging around with Sonny Boy but when he was 10. Yeah, but that's not... That's not like a career. That's but I'm just saying the chance, the fact that he got to hang out with this guy. So did Junior Wells. The and same basically be adopted. No, no, no. Sonny Boy adopted Cotton. He adopted Cotton. I, he basically, I want to see that. No, no, no. I mean, he told me this himself. He goes, he goes, yeah, Sonny Boy, he gave me that band, man. When he went up to Milwaukee, he said, James, you got the band. And I was 16, and I fucked all that shit up. He goes, those guys didn't want to listen to some little kid. <laughs> so, so he basically said he kind of blew the whole thing. And then he went and recorded for Sun Records by yeah. the time he was 18 or something. And yeah. got the gig with Muddy when he was, you know, in his early 20s, mid 50s. He had the gig. He told me about that. Uh, he said, when I, um, he said, I stayed in, in the basement. And I learned every single note Little Walter played. Right, because, because Muddy wanted was, that. Because I felt that when, when Muddy was ready to make a change, I wanted that gig so bad. Right. That I, and, he, and that's how he got it. Yeah. He played, and, and Muddy made all of his harp players do that. He made George Smith do that. He yeah. made Junior Wells do that. All of these guys had to sound like Little Walter. Yeah. And, and I remember one of the greatest stories God never told me is he said, 
He said the first time he went to go see Lil Walter, and this one he was with Muddy and, and he moved to Chicago, and he said he walked in and he got a booth in the back by the stage, and he said all of a sudden he sees this guy and two women are holding him up because he's so drunk, and they bring him to the stage, and he gets on stage, and he grabs the mic, and he goes, I didn't think this guy would be able to play two notes. And he goes, and the guy started blowing, and it was the best harmonica I'd ever heard Could in you my life. That? And he goes, he goes, I was, I literally sat there and cried. He goes, I wanted to throw my harps in the river after that. Well, I don't know if you're going to use this next part, but uh, my uh, the, one of our drummers in Chicago, Robert Covington, great drummer. Right. He uh, said before he moved to Chicago, he was in Mississippi, and Little Walter, towards the end of his life, was touring by himself, and he was using pickup bands from. So Robert said he put together a little a little trio, and he set up a rehearsal in the basement of one of the houses, and Little Walter was supposed to come down to rehearse with them. And he didn't show up for a while. All of a sudden, they heard this like commotion at uh, the door, like banging and clanging, and everything was falling. He heard like shit falling down the stairs. And then little Walter shows up, but all disheveled. And he picks up his attache case, slams it on the table, and it, it flies open. And a gunshot, a gun, a little pistol start, like flies out onto the floor. And little Walter picks it up, and first, he didn't say a word yet. And, he, and then the first word he said was, I just want all I want all y'all boys to know I'm a bad mother. <laughs> Especially on my entrances. <laughs> my entrances are especially badass. Oh my god. Yeah. No, I've heard all kinds of stories about Walter. I mean, you know, the, the bottom line is when when you ask guys, you know, certain guys like like Cotton or Cotton uh, the other thing he said is I go, "Did he ever show you any?" He said, he said he said, anytime I'd ask him, he'd go like this. Show me this. And he'd go. <laughs> <laughs> and he'd show him with his back to him. Yeah. You know, you can, whatever you're supposed it was. to be able to hear it. Well, yeah. Yeah, cotton. Yeah. cotton. And, and that was the whole thing. You know, was it, is it, you know, I mean, basically blues is an ear music. And, yeah. and, and most guys, you know, most blues guys don't really know that yeah. much music theory or... And that's how come the jazz guys always kind of looked down on the blues guys because they knew all this music theory that the blues guys didn't. So a lot of the blues guys, to me, wanted to be jazz guys. If they got really sophisticated guys like Robert Jr. or <laughs> Matt Guitar Murphy, they kind of wanted to be jazz guys. Mm -hmm. You know, There's very few jazz guys who could play blues. That's true. Yeah. It's a very select blues, especially few. Because we bend a lot of notes. Right. The guitars, you know. Right. Piano slurs, right. the horn slur, yep. and uh, that, you know, in jazz you hear it, but it's a whole different thing. You know, it's, yeah. it's much simpler. Yeah. And, and to me, blues is a story, and it's a vocal form, too. You, you, each story is like a little vignette, right? you know, at its best. Right. Like these songs I like, you know, like Going Down Slow or Things Trouble like in Mind. Yeah. Trouble in Mind, yeah. and things about real life. Yeah, you know. yeah. Nothing pretty about it. And and the, and the greatest singers are the ones that can make that come to life. Yeah. You know. Yeah. I used to, my favorite, one of my favorites is Freddie King for singing. Yeah. A lot of voice. Well, I, I, heard, I heard Barbara Dane one night do Trouble in Mind, and it was one of the She's great. heaviest versions I ever yeah. heard her do. She, I remember her coming to Chicago in the, in the 70s. Right. And she was pretty young. That's when Dietra must have met her. Well, I, I saw her yeah. at the Kingston Mines. And I believe she had, I think she had uh, Freddie Below playing drums. Could be, yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. she used a lot of the people on the Chicago scene. I mean, people from Muddy's bands, uh, people like, you know. Uh, uh, Span. Span. Yeah. Uh, Francis Clay. I remember yeah. Clay yeah. knew her immediately when I, well, oh, I yeah. got to be friends with him in the 80s or 70s. I got to be friends with him, and I remember them knowing each other. I was like, "Wow, I didn't know you two guys knew each other." Yeah, you know. Yeah. So when we come back, we're going to play a number for you. Sounds good.
All right, here's one I'm gonna do some weird. Speaking of the Bluebird Records, and, and uh, that was RCA Victor label, and this is one by the very first Sonny Boy Williamson, John Lee, John Lee Williamson, and this is one of his called Honey Bee Blues. It goes like this. Take a walk with me. I want you to come on, baby. Come on and take a walk with me. You know, I won't let nothing bother you if you just be my little honeybee. I'll make you honey in the morning Little girl, I will make you honey all through the night I'll make you honey in the morning Little girl, I will make you honey all through the night I'll make you honey three times a day. Little girl, you just treat your daddy right. We'll take a walk out in the park. Little girl, I want to sit under some shady tree. We'll take a walk out in the park. Little girl, I wanna sit under some shady tree. If you just be my little honeybee, little girl, I will make your honey just right. Oh, here we go. Just 
call me daddy. Little girl, I will make your honey just right. <laughs> Give a woman. 